Welcome everyone to Pathways Through the Orchard. Tonight is Parshat Bo, this whole week, of course, and we have a number of uh, insights. The first we're going to start with is that in this week's Parsha are the last three of the 10 plagues, and also the preparation for what we'll call the first Seder. In other words, the preparation for coming out of Egypt. Before the 10th plague, uh, God comes to Moshe and gives him all these instructions about matzah and putting the blood above the doorpost and the lintel and all of the preparations for coming out of Egypt. And then towards the end of the Parsha is the 10th plague. And Israel prepares to leave Egypt. And so there are a couple of verses that I want to draw everyone's attention to. As what I want, what I want to give over is that we see here the basis of the four questions on Seder night. Everyone knows in the Haggadah, we have the, the four sons, the four children, and the four questions. So we want to show in this Parsha where it begins from. So for those who have a uh, Chumash in front of them, it's in the 12th chapter, the 25th verse, 1225 and 26. So it says like this, And again, remember, this is still in Egypt. And this is all in preparation for coming out. So God says, when you come into the land that God is giving you, as he has spoken, you shall, you shall observe or guard this service. And then the next verse is, ki yomru alechem b'nechem. Ma lechem. And it will happen that when your children ask you, what, what is this service? Meaning, Seder night. What are, what are we doing? What are we remembering? Why are we doing this? And then it gives an answer. The answer right now is less important than we have the, the question. And then one more time in the Parsha, towards the end. So it's this is in chapter 13, the 14th verse, 13, 14. It says, V'haya ki yishalcha bincha machar lemor. And it will be when your child asks you tomorrow. Well, the tomorrow means throughout history. Lemor, mazot, what is this? And you will answer that with a strong arm, God took us out of Egypt from the house of bondage. So here is another question. Later in the Torah, it will happen another two times. Another two times, it will be when in the future your children ask you, why are we remembering this night? What is this service? What are we doing? And each one has an, an answer. So here, this one I just read, which is mazot, this is actually the question of the child, She'enu Yodeli Shol, is the fourth child who doesn't know how to ask. And, well, excuse me, 
It's the, it's the simple one, excuse me, it's the third son who says, Mazot, what, what is this? What are we doing? And each time the Torah gives a different answer. So that's what I want to point out is that the Haggadah is really one of the most uh, amazing uh, educational paradigms that we have. For those who are familiar, I wrote a whole book on the Haggadah, Haggadah Companion, called Paradigm, Process, and Paradox, a Haggadah Companion. And the first chapter in the book points out the, the absolute brilliant educational strategies that are used in the Haggadah. And it's a known thing that even in our day where you have many, many people who never go to synagogue or only go to synagogue maybe on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, but there are many Jews who don't even do that. But probably the two most popular uh, rituals in the Jewish year is Seder night and lighting Hanukkah candles. And this kind of cuts across the board. Even people who are, who are far from being religious, well, many will make an attempt to attend a Pesach Seder. So here we have in our Parsha, the first of the, the questions where the Torah says, in the future, when your children ask you, what is this service? So this is the basis of the four children and the four questions that is such a important part. And since we're on the idea of the Haggadah, because again, in this Parsha, we come out of Egypt. We come out of Egypt after years of slavery. So as I said, the, the Haggadah is one of the most popular uh, texts in, in Jewish history that there have been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of commentaries written on the Haggadah. I am among them. <laughs> I am among them. I'm in good company because throughout the generations, every year new uh, commentaries come out on the Haggadah. That the way that the sages crafted the Haggadah in an eternal way that every generation can, can see new insight into how they set up the Haggadah. But what I want to just make everyone aware is what was the, uh, call it the, the cardinal inspiration for the basic text of the Haggadah. So here we already said that here we found a, the, the source in our Parsha and a few other Parshas for the four sons and the four questions. <clears throat> but the, the actual um, framework for the Haggadah comes from Parsha Kitavo in the book of Devarim, book of Deuteronomy in the 26th chapter. And this is based on the uh, first fruits. When Israel would bring from the seven special fruits of Eretz Yisrael, especially two of them are grains, but the five special fruits of Israel, that it was, it was a uh, halacha to, if you're an owner of a uh, orchard, to bring the first fruits to the temple. And when a person would come with the first fruits, he would recite what's called the vidui, which literally means a confession. But it's not the confession in the typical usage of the word confession. It's more of an acknowledgement. And I'm not gonna, read the whole thing, 
But what's important is the, the, the main word here. Says Ubatel Cohen, you shall bring these first fruits to the Cohen. Asher Yeba Bayimahem that will be in those days. Be a Marta Elav, and you will say to him, He gadati hayom la shem elokecha, ki bati el ha orat asher nishpa ashem la tenu la tetlanu. He gadati. I am telling today that Hashem brought us into this land that he promised our fathers, our patriarchs and matriarchs to give to us. But the word here is vihigadati. I will tell, I will acknowledge, I will praise God for bringing us into the land. And that's where the word Haggadah comes from, from higadati. I, it's telling over the story. And, and this confession continues, and it, it goes back all the ways in Jewish history and says how we went down to Egypt and we were oppressed and we became slaves and we cried out to God and he heard our voice and he brought us out of Egypt with a strong arm and great miracles. And he brought us to this place, to this wonderful land flowing with milk and honey. And now I have brought the first fruits of my labors to acknowledge my thanks to God for having done all of this. And this becomes the, the, the kernel the core structure of the Haggadah, where we go back and we tell the whole story, going all the way back to Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, going down to Egypt, and the, the slavery, the 10 plagues coming out. <clears throat> and then as the Seder moves along, we give praise for giving us the land of Israel. So having said that, I do want to point out one very, very important thing is that when we get to the, the theme of the holiday of Pesach, and again, it's in this Parsha that we're told for the first time about eating matzah and that we can't have uh, unleavened bread and the whole holiday of Pesach, seven days, it's in this Parsha. And so probably the most important thing to know about the holiday of Pesach and the Seder, Pesach night, is that there's, there's two levels of understanding the holiday. One level is the great importance of connecting to our history celebrating the Seder night, Pesach night in remembrance of coming out of Egypt is 3,300 and some years that we've been keeping this ritual year after year after year. And when we observe Seder night, we are adding one more link to the chain that goes all the ways back. And this is our collective history. And when we read the Haggadah, we see that it's, it's much more than just the exile in Egypt. The Haggadah really uh, emphasizes all of Jewish history, all of the exiles, all of the redemptions, all of the slaveries and expulsions and pogroms and inquisitions and crusades and holocausts, everything is compacted into the Seder. So that's one incredibly important thing to connect to our history, to connect to the Jewish people, to connect to God, connect to the Torah. But there's another level that is just as important 
And that is that it, more than just telling the story of how 3,300 and some years ago, our, our patriarchs and our matriarchs and the tribes came out of Egypt, came out of bondage. What's essential about Pesach is that each and every person has to look at those things in their life that are enslaving us, that are holding us back, that are oppressing us. And we need to get out of Egypt now. It's, it's, it's wonderful to connect to how we once came out of Egypt. But if we go through all of Pesach, and we end Pesach, and we feel just as stuck, as just as uh, cramped by our self-imposed prisons, then we haven't really observed Pesach properly. So this is a very, very important point. And as I said, it's this Parsha where we have the, the, the structure of, of the whole holiday of Pesach, of Matzah, and Moror, and the, the Paschal offering, uh, Korban Pesach. The whole thing is in this, in this Parsha. So Pesach is around three months away, but I hope everyone will remember this uh, super important idea that as we prepare for Pesach, it's not just cleaning our houses from the chametz. It's preparing for us to leave our own Egypt now. As everyone knows, the word Egypt in Hebrew, Mitzrayim, comes from the word Meitzar, which means a narrow place. And we all have those narrow places that we need to break through, those obstacles that we need to uh, jump over, climb under if we have to, break down to get out of our self-imposed exiles. So Pesach is quite a ways away, but these are the parshas that we're reading now. So it's not too early to start to think of this. Now, as part of the preparations for leaving Egypt. So Moshe is relaying all the different laws that will happen on that night and what will happen in the future. As I said before, this is the, the whole uh, instructions of taking a lamb on the 10th of Nisan and slaughtering it. And that becomes the Paschal offering, the Korban Pesach, and to take that blood and to put it over the doorpost and the lintels. And that's the literal meaning of Passover. Pesach is God passed over, leaped over the houses that had the, had the blood. Along with all of those instructions about matzah and moror, and not having chametz. There's also the mitzvah of what we now call pidyon haben, of redeeming the firstborn child, firstborn son who is born in a natural way. After 30 days, there is a ritual called pidyon haben, which means the redeeming of the firstborn. And it comes from this parsha. This is the first time that it's mentioned. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's in the beginning of chapter 13, where it says, Hashem Moshe Limor. God says to Moshe, Kadesh li kol b'chor, Peter kol rechem, b'bnei Yisrael, ba'adam u'bebehema li hu. So this mitzvah, which we have to this day, is uh, make holy for me the firstborn 
who comes from the opening of the womb among the sons of Israel, among, uh, among the children of Israel, and among the animals. So a firstborn animal of a mother uh, kosher animal at the time of the temple was brought as an offering. And the firstborn son is, but it has to be, if there's a daughter born first, then it's already not a pidyon haben. It's only if the first child born in a natural way, not a, a um, cesarean. It has to be the opening of the womb. Then 30 days later is what's called pidyon haben. And so it's introduced in our Parsha, but it's only explained later in the book of Numbers, Bamidbar, in the Parsha of Korach, chapter 18, verse 15. So it says like this. It says, it repeats this idea that the firstborn um, is, is made holy to God. And then it says, Ach poda tifda et bachor adam, ya bachor behema hatmea tifda. An unkosher animal, the firstborn, is also redeemed with money instead of bringing it as an offering, because you can't bring a non kosher animal as an offering in the temple. So unkosher domesticated animals. Were, um, were redeemed. And then it says, well, how, how does this redemption happen? That's in the 16th verse. And we do this to this day, is that on the 30th day, we do a redemption that the, 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 the son uh, at 30 days is, is redeemed through giving five pieces of, of the equivalent of, of five silver pieces. And I don't know the exact measurement today, but th there is a, a certain amount and it's given to a, a Kohen. And that is the ritual of redeeming the firstborn. So then the question is, why, why did God uh, give us this mitzvah? And so it's, it's directly connected with the 10th plague. And that was the killing of the firstborn of Egypt. That was the 10th plague. And that was just like the first plague and the 10th plague are connected. And the 10 plagues uh, uh, arrange themselves according to the spherot. The first plague begins below with Malchut. The second plague is Yesod, so forth, until the last plague is the highest sphere of Keter. But we know that Keter means crown, and that's the highest. The lowest of the spherot is Malchut, is the king. So the highest and the lowest are always connected together. So the highest and the lowest both have to do with the fact that Pharaoh and the Egyptians were drowning all of the male children of Israel to avoid having a redeemer born. So when God redeemed us from Egypt, and the first pl plague and the last plague was a, it was a measure for measure. That's why the Nile turned red because the babies were being drowned and killed in the Nile. And then the 10th one, which didn't have to get there if, if Pharaoh would have let us go even without the first plague, but he didn't. And the, and the last one was the killing of the firstborn. And then God tells Moshe that this is the, the, the reasoning behind this, this idea of 
sanctifying the firstborn to God because God saved us through the last plague is the killing of the firstborn. And the whole idea, which says later in the Torah, that Israel is called God's firstborn. We are the Bechor. We are the firstborn. And so this ritual is done till today. And I, I mentioned in one of the classes, I, I just saw recently a very, very moving video of, he turned out he was, he was, he was an American originally, and he was in Aza. He was a soldier in Aza. And he was there from right from the beginning. And his wife gave birth while he was in Aza. And on the 30th day, he needed to do pity on a bed. And so in Aza with his unit, he did pity on a bed. And they videoed it. And he, he made this incredibly emotional speech. Um, it, was, it was very, very, very moving. So my point is, is that this ritual is still done to this day. One of my students just last week on his, his son's firstborn did a pity on a bed. So now I just want to share just a few deep uh, secrets of pity on a bed. So again, pity on a bed literally means redemption of the, of, the, of, the, of the son, the firstborn. So the word pity on, which means redemption, equals 150. Pidion equals 150 in Gematria. So what is the significance of that? We know that we have exactly 150 psalms. 150 psalms. And so that's one of the reasons that in times of trouble, and especially now we've discussed this a number of times, how people all over the world are saying psalms every day, every congregation, many individuals are saying psalms because the 150 psalms is a redemptive energy. We connect to redemption through the 150 psalms and that is the gematria of Pideyon, of the redemption of the firstborn. Haben Pidion Haben, Haben equals 57. 57 equals the word Zan, which means to provide. This is, people will recognize this from the first blessing in our uh, grace after meals, and the blessing we say after eating bread. The blessing is Baruch Ata Hashem Hazan Et HaKol. We bless God who provides for everyone. So the beautiful connection here is, the tradition is that as each child is born, whether it's male or female, the idea is Parnasa comes with the child. It's in, in, in much of the world, in much of the world, Many places are having very few children. In fact, China, which for years, um, decades, put a limit on how many children you could have because there's so many people in China. Well, after a whole generation like this, you have a, a very aging population and a younger generation is not uh, coming forward. So China has now reversed themselves and is encouraging people to have children. But in much of the Western world, um, people just aren't having that many children. And a lot of it is um, economic. It's, it, it costs a lot of money to raise a child. It costs a lot of money for schooling, especially Jewish schooling these days. It costs a lot of money to send children to 
college. So along with other reasons, many people are like zero, one, or at the most two. In our tradition, every child that comes into the world brings their uh, livelihood, brings the livelihood. So that's the, the alluded to meaning of the gematria of Pidion Haben is Zan, that sustenance will be provided. Now, when you put the whole term together, Pidion Haben, it equals 207, equals light. Light equals 207. And also, what else equals 207? Ein Sof, the word for infinity. Ein Sof. Now, and when you put them together, this is the or Ein Sof, the infinite light of, of God. And so what's the connection here? The connection here is, is connected to a, uh, a, a reality and a halacha is that if a child, chas v'shalom, chas v'shalom, doesn't make it to the 30th day, and even today it, it happens, in generations gone by, and especially in ancient days, it, it wasn't uncommon for both women to die in childbirth, like Rachel did, Rachel, and for babies not, not to make it. And so if a child, again, chas v'shalom, passes away before 30 days, you don't say Kaddish. Because it's considered that the baby wasn't firmly in the world yet. The neshama wasn't firmly established in the body. Once a baby male or female, reaches 30 days and they would pass away, then you do say Kaddish for them. So here, Pidiona Ben, the redemption of the firstborn, <coughs> excuse me, happens on the 30th day. And so what that means spiritually is that the light of the neshama that's coming from a heavenly abode is now entrenched in the vessel of the body enough that it's hoped for and expected that it, it, will, it will survive. And so this is a halacha to this day. And so here, the pity of Ben, when you do the redemption of the firstborn, it's also the recognition of this light is now ready to shine in this world. So this is a, just a, a few very, very beautiful ideas about Pidion Haben. Now we're going to move into a, another idea. And that is, I think we mentioned already two weeks ago, starting in Parshat Shemot, the most important character for the rest of the Torah is Moshe. Moshe is first mentioned in the first parsha of the book of Shemot. And from then on, he becomes the most essential personality running through the whole rest of the Torah. Last week, we began with the first of the 10 plagues. There were seven in Parsha Ve'era. And in this Parsha, there are three last plagues, a total of 10 plagues. And there is much discussion. And I will uh, urge, uh, well, it was last week already. Last week, if you didn't have a chance, on your living with the times, there was a whole discussion of the importance of the number 10. Why 10 plagues? Why not seven or 12 or some other number? And we answered that by connecting it to a whole 
string of different tens. So one of the connections of the 10 plagues is with the 10 spherot and the 10 commandments and the 10 expressions to which the world is created. So one of Rabbi Ginsburg's uh, main teachings is how to use the svirot as a way to understand reality. Whether it's a person that we're trying to understand, a name, a story, a word, is we can kind of run it through the 10 svirot to see how in, in the case that we're going to do now, we're going to look at Moshe Rabbeinu, and we're going to try to understand what is the Keter of Moshe Rabbeinu. How does Moshe reveal himself or is manifest in Keter, in Chachma, in Bina, in Dat, all of the Svirot. So with the time that we have remaining, we're going to go through the Svirot and try to understand how just like uh, this we're not going to do, but there are many, many, many commentaries connecting the 10 spherot with the 10 spherot, with the 10 plagues with the 10 spherot. How the first one of blood is connected to Malchut. And how the second one of frogs is connected to Yesod. And so, so on and so forth. So we're going to do this with Moshe Rabbeinu. And uh, I know that some of them are on YouTube. That uh, a few years back, Rob Ginsburg gave a once a month English class in Jerusalem, and it was broadcast around the world. And I had the great privilege of being the MC of this whole um uh, class, which went on for a couple of years. And Rav Ginsburg took many of the personalities in the Torah and did what we're about to do. So some of them are on YouTube and you could probably access them. The truth is we could go into great detail about this, but because of limits of time, we're just going to go through the 10 relatively quickly. But it's such a, a great way to, to learn, to be able to see uh, a personality not as one-dimensional, to see all the different aspects of how a person is, is revealed and manifest in the world through the Svirot. So... We're going to start with Keter, the highest of the Svirot. And Rav Ginsburg points out, and again, this is from the Arizal, from the Zohar, that Moshe Rabbeinu is considered the most eternal and ancient of all souls. The name Moshe is considered the three letters of Moshe. The Mem stands for Moshe. The Shin stands for Shet, and the He stands for Hevel. The first two children were Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel, and then Adam and Chava have another child named Shet. And it's brought down by the Arizal that Shet is the first reincarnation. He is a reincarnation of Hevel. And it's actually learned from the text itself. And so Moshe, his initial soul goes all the way back to the first child, Cain and Abel. And his soul, the Zohar says, the soul of Moshe is present in every generation. And another statement says, every 50 years, the soul of Moshe will incarnate into the world. And it's usually into the leaders of the generation. Now, sometimes it's not a full incarnation, 
it's what we'll call a spark of Moshe is in every generation. So the idea here is, and that's why it's connected to Keter, that the soul of Moshe is coming from the highest place. And in a previous class, we discussed all the different mentions of water that are connected to Moshe. His name literally means Mina Mai Mishitiho. From the water, he was drawn. Well, the water here in the most primordial way is the primordial Torah, that the soul of Moshe is being drawn from the primordial Torah. Rav Ginsburg actually reveals one more, even higher level, and that is in the Torah, Moshe is called Ish Elohim, a man of God, Ish Elohim. And so the, the Gomorrah says, what does that mean? So it says that from Moshe's waist up, he was like Elohim. And from the waist down, he was like a man. And this, we actually learned this last week. This is connected to this, the name Adam. Aleph is the soul and the Dam is the body. So Moshe is being drawn, not just from the primordial Torah, but is being drawn from Elohim. So in the Torah, it says that Adam was created with Selim Elohim, in the image of God. And so Rav Ginsburg says an amazing thing. He says that that image of God was really Moshe. In other words, the image of Adam was the image of Moshe, whose root soul was being drawn from Elohim. And for those who were at the class last week, so we discussed at length this idea that God says to Moshe, go to Pharaoh, for I have made you Elohim to Pharaoh, and Aaron will be your prophet. So we discussed that at length. So here, we're not saying that Moshe is Elohim. We have to be very careful here. But we're saying that the image of God, that Adam was created, in actuality was the image of Moshe. And this is pointing out his ancient um, primordial essence. So that's connected to Keter, the highest of the Svirot. Moshe's wisdom is that he draws the Torah into the world. He's chosen to bring the wisdom of the Torah down into this world. And as discussed, anytime it says water in the Torah, it's an allusion to Torah itself, and the the Torah is is uh, the metaphor. It's it's connected to water, and so Moshe bringing the Torah down from Sinai is again he's being drawn from the water. But here he's drawing the water because his soul was drawn from the water. He is the one to draw the water of the Torah into the world. That is the wisdom of Moshe. Bina, so there's a statement in the Talmud, Moshe zacha lebina. Moshe merited to understanding, to bina. And we're told that there are chamishim share bina. There are 50 gates of understanding. And these 50 gates of understanding are represented very much in the 50 days between Pesach and Shavuot. We count 49 days in Sfirah to Omer, seven times seven weeks. And the 50th day is Shavuot. Shavuot is the giving of the Torah. And so Moshe is very connected because he's the one who's going to receive the Torah 
for Israel and to bring it down on the 50th day. So Moshe merited to Bina. As I said, we're going through this fairly, fairly quickly. And the level of dot, of knowledge. So the Alter Rebbe, again, this is something we've discussed. The Baal Shem Tov said that um, we all have a spark of Mashiach. And the Alter Rebbe said we have a spark of Moshe. Well, this is almost the same thing because Moshe will be incarnate into Mashiach. He is the first redeemer, and he is the last redeemer. Mashiach is the soul of Moshe and David. And so the whole generation, excuse me, I'm going back. So the altar Rebbe said, well, what is this spark of Moshe within us? That's the spark of dat, of intellect. And therefore, the whole generation was called Dor Dea. That's how the whole generation that came out of Egypt is referred to. It's the generation of knowledge. And they're called that because of Moshe's knowledge. Because he was the, the leader. He was the tzaddik. And so he was a, 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 a what's called a neshama kolelet. He, everyone was included in Moshe. His influence touched everyone. So that's the level of dad. It spread to all of Israel. And we all have this spark of, of knowledge. Then comes chesed, loving kindness. So Moshe was full of loving kindness. When he went out to check about on his on his brothers, he was still prince of Egypt, but he was aware at that point that he was Jewish, and he saw the Egyptian taskmaster uh, beating a Jew to death, and so his his chesed, and we'll see that this is connected to Tiferet as well, welled up, and then he saved Sipora and her sisters at the well. And he sacrificed everything for the Jewish people because of his giving. He was, he, his whole soul was given over to the Jewish people. On the level of Gevura, so we see that, that, that Moshe, he has one side which is Chesed, but he had a very strong side. He kills the Egyptian. He saves Zipporah from the, the shepherds. He stands up to Pharaoh. He stands up to Israel that many times said, let's stone Moshe and Aaron and let's go back to Egypt. He stood up and he even stood up to God. When God was, as it were, threatening to finish the Jewish people and start all over with Moshe. So he showed his gevura for 40 years. He was, he was like a pillar of strength leading us through the desert. So that's the gevura. Teferet, the inner dimension of Teferet is rachamim, is compassion. And along with Moshe's humbleness, the Torah says he was the most humble person on the face of the earth. His other major quality, along with chesed, was compassion. And he had true compassion for other people. In fact, the, the, the famous Midrash, why God chose Moshe, <clears throat> is that Moshe is watching the sheep of, of his father-in-law, and a little sheep ran away. Instead of sending one of the other shepherds, he goes to search with this little sheep himself. And he sees the sheep licking some water from a little crevice in the rock. And he says, oh, 
Now I understand why he ran away. I, I, I obviously didn't give him enough water to drink. And he, he put the sheep on his shoulders and he walked back to the, to the flock. And the Midrash says that God, of course, is watching this whole thing. And he says, this is the shepherd I want for my flock. But it was his compassion for this little sheep that drew God's interest. The next thing in the Torah is God appears to him at the burning bush. So that is Moshe's tiferet, his compassion. The next sphere is netzach, which means victory and eternity. So we already discussed in, in Keter the eternal essence of Moshe's soul. He is the most eternal soul that returns in every generation. And the other meaning of Netzach is victory. And so it's Moshe who uh, leads us out of Egypt, leads us through a war with Amalek, with Sichon and Og, and brings us to the gates of the Holy Land. And so he, he was victorious. He, he accomplished his mission. And it's full of victory. And then comes Hod. Hod, one of the meanings of Hod means glory. And later in the Torah, it describes that when Moshe came down from Har Sinai, his face was beaming so much that the people were afraid to look at him. It was such an awesome sight to see a human being radiating light in such a uh, tangible way. And so one of the ways that we refer to these beams of light are, are carne or, that's what they call in the Torah, beams of light, but it's also carne hod, that Moshe was reflecting the glory of God. So that's the, the aspect of Moshe that's connected to Hod. We already, uh, I didn't connect it to Yisod, but when Moshe is called Ish Elohim, a man of God, so the lower half of Moshe, as it were, was the man, and that is Yisod. That's the aspect of Yisod. And also, we, we, we learn from tradition that Moshe was born circumcised, <clears throat> which is connected to the sphera of Yesod. And finally, Malchut, kingship. So for all practical purposes, Moshe was like a king. He, he, he was the, the powerful leader of Am Yisrael. And in the last part of the Torah, it says, by Yeshurun Melech. There was a king in Yeshurun. Yeshurun is, is a name that approximates Yisrael. Yeshurun. It has many of the same letters. And there's two uh, uh, views of who is this king. There was a king in Yeshurun. So some say, we're just talking about God. And others say it was talking about Moshe, that he wasn't technically a king, but for all practical purposes, he was, he was king. So that's his malchut. So here, in a very, very quick manner, we see the multi-dimensions of Moshe. Uh, and this is true of, of ourselves and any personality. And it's really super fascinating because we tend uh, to identify certain pers personalities with one characteristic. Avram is called Chesed. Yitzhak is called Gevura. Yaakov is Teferet. Moshe is Netzach. Aaron is Hod. 
Yosef is Yesod. David is Malchut. This is connected to the seven Ushpizim, the seven special guests who visit us on Sukkot. And each day is connected to one of the Svirot. And also when we're counting Svirot to Omer, each of the weeks is connected to one of the Svirot, but it's also connected to one of these personalities. But that's only one of their characteristics. And so this uh, model that I shared with you tonight that I learned from Rav Ginsburg is how to take a personality and just by looking at the stories in the Torah or the Midrashim or the Talmud, what we know about these personalities and all of a sudden we see that they might have a main characteristic, a personality trait, but they really have all of them. This is called the secret of interinclusion, that all 10 spherot have all 10 spherot within them. It's a fractal. So this is also a very beautiful model to look at ourselves, to try to understand what is our Keter, what is our Chachma, our Bina, our Dat, etc. So hopefully we accomplished seeing the multi-dimensions of Moshe Rabbeinu. And just going back to this whole Parsha is in this week we, we get out of Egypt. And so I want to end with a blessing that right now, Israel and Jews all over the world are are being tested. We're, we're a, a, a crucible, a mikvah of fire here. And so hopefully this week, this energy of redemption, of, of salvation, of exodus, really, really plays itself out in, in our reality today. And that we, we experience a real redemption from our our current situation. Be'ezrat Hashem.